Hey there gang and welcome to this asynchronous JavaScript tutorial. Now I do already have an asynchronous JS course on YouTube but that's now about four years old so I'm putting up a more up-to-date series which is straight from my Udemy modern JavaScript course and it's going to cover things like the fetch API, promises, async and await as well as all of the basics and building blocks of what asynchronous code is. So I hope you enjoy it and if you want to take the full Udemy course the link is going to be down below in the description. Asynchronous JavaScript is one of the most important parts of the language because it governs how we perform tasks that take some time to do, like requesting data from a database or from an API. And chances are, if you're making a real JavaScript application, then you will be using asynchronous code at some point to do these kinds of things. So in a very simplistic nutshell, asynchronous code is code that can start now and then finish later. But before we talk more about asynchronous code, let's first of all understand its counterpart, synchronous code. So JavaScript by its very nature is a synchronous language. And that basically means that JavaScript can execute only one statement at a time from top to bottom. So for example, in a JavaScript file, we could have three statements and each statement is run in turn. Now line two cannot start before line one is finished and line three cannot start before line two is finished. So it executes these one at a time in order. Now you might hear JavaScript being called a single threaded language, and that essentially means the same thing. A thread is like an ordered sequence of statements, and only one of those statements can run at a time. So this is the crux of synchronous code, one statement being executed at a time after one another. Now with this image of synchronous code in mind, a single thread and only one statement executing at a time Imagine this scenario. We want to call a bunch of JavaScript functions in a file. Some of these functions do quick little things like log something to a console, but one of them wants to make a network request to a database on another server somewhere to get some data. Now, this could take two or three seconds to complete, maybe less, maybe more. So in a synchronous programming world, because only one statement can run at a time, this fetching of data stalls the program. This is known as blocking code because it blocks the next line of code from running until it gets the data back and this function is complete after those two or three seconds. Now in this case you might think well okay two seconds isn't that long to wait but what if you have multiple functions to get data then that could soon be five to six seconds or six to seven seconds and it would block the rest of the code underneath from running until these things are complete. So this is a downfall of synchronous code, and this is where asynchronous code comes into play to help us out. So we know that running our functions synchronously when it comes to tasks that take some time to complete is probably then not the best way to work, right? So remember the definition I first gave you of asynchronous code, to start something now and finish it later. This is the pattern we generally want to follow when running tasks that take some time to do, like network request for data to a database or an API. So imagine we have the same kind of sequence of function calls or statements, only this time, instead of this being some kind of synchronous function to request data, we use an asynchronous function instead. And this means the function can start now and then finish later once the data has come back from wherever we get it from. Now, since this function is finishing later, what we typically do is pass this function or this statement some kind of callback function as a parameter. And then that callback function is the thing that runs and finishes later on once the request is complete and the data comes back. So how is this all working exactly? Well, we have our queue of function calls in the code again, which are executed one at a time. So first this one, then this one and so forth. Now remember, at all times, JavaScript can only execute one thing at a time. But this time, when we get to the request function here, we are using an asynchronous function to request that external data. What this means is that the browser takes that request and it handles it outside of the scope of this single thread in another part of the browser. It also takes a callback function and puts it to one side too, so that it knows to execute this later on when the data comes back. So because this network request has been taken out of this thread and is now running in a different part of the browser, JavaScript can carry on down the queue and run the remaining functions. All the while, this is still going on, the request for data. 
So it continues through these functions and then when it receives the data back from the network request and once the rest of the functions have been executed, then we're allowed to call this callback function and finish this original function. So this is the crux of asynchronous programming, starting something now which can be finished later. And it makes our code non-blocking because the rest of the functions here, they can run while the request is being made. Now this explanation is a very simplistic one and there are other things at play such as the event loop and the call stack which we've not discussed but I think to delve into that right now would be a bit overwhelming and I think this picture of painted should be enough for now to understand the general idea of asynchronous code. So now we know a little about what that is and what asynchronous code does, let's have a look at an example. Okay then, so hopefully now you understand at least the basic principle of asynchronous code and how JavaScript has a single thread and runs through one function at a time or one statement at a time. So I want to do a quick demo of this in action, a very quick simple one. So the first thing I'm going to do is paste in four console logs. So if I save this, we know now that JavaScript is going to execute these one at a time from top to bottom. And in the console, we get one, two, three, four as expected. Now, what I'm going to do in the middle is I'm going to do a set timeout. And we've seen this before. It's where we pass in a function and that function fires after a certain amount of time that we specify. So let's do the function first of all. And inside here, we'll console.log and we'll say the callback function fired. Okay, and we want to fire this after, well, let's just say 2000 milliseconds, so that's two seconds. So this right here, this is meant to emulate some kind of network request that takes time to do. So imagine this is going out to get data and it takes two seconds to do. Then when it comes back, it's going to fire a callback function. It's the same kind of thing. In this case, we're not getting data. We're just waiting two seconds to emulate that request. And then we're firing this. So this right here, this is asynchronous code in action. It's going to start when the file runs. It's going to wait two seconds and then it's going to finish later by firing this callback function. Now, is this going to block the rest of the code? Will it go one, two, then wait two seconds and fire this, then three, four? Or will it not block the code? Well, I just said that this is asynchronous, so it doesn't block the code. And I'll show you that. If I save it, we see one, two, three, four. Then after two seconds, we get this. So if you imagine that image of a thread I showed you before, and these things are on it, it fires this, then this, then this. And then it waits two seconds over here and passes the callback function somewhere else. And then it fires this, then this. And after two seconds, the callback function is added to the bottom over here. And this is where it fires at the end after one, two, three, four. So this does not block the code. So in the future, instead of using set timeout, we'll be using real HTTP network requests for data. But this kind of sets the scene of how it all works. It will be the same principle. So now we know the general principle behind it of asynchronous code, I'm going to show you how to actually make network requests.